Forward, Publisher's Note, and Chapters 1 through 5 of Pep, Poise, Efficiency, Peace. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by J. A. Carter. Pep, Poise, Efficiency, Peace, by Colonel William Crosby Hunter. Pep. Poise, Efficiency, Peace, A Book of Hows, Not Wise, for Physical and Mental Efficiency, by Colonel William C. Hunter, author of Brass Tax, Dollars and Cents, The Bill Books. Forward. Thought habit will become fixed on faith or fear, and the result to the man is good or bad accordingly. If your thought is fixed on faith, in the greater meaning you are invincible. If it is fixed on fear, or its elder child, worry, you stand helpless, weak, conquered, and miserable. If I can, by suggestion, logic, example, proof, reason, or humor, get your thought habit fixed on faith, and coach you to the understanding that will give you poise, efficiency, peace, then I will have done a thing well worth while. To that end, and with that purpose, I dedicate my services and this book to each of you who read it. William C. Hunter June 10th, 1914. Publisher's Note I believe in Colonel Hunter's book, Pep. For that matter, so does Mr. Britton, but I write this note because I made myself over by applying Colonel Hunter's rules for thinking and living to my daily life. In 1909, I was a sick man, suffering from nerves and food poisoning, auto-intoxication. I weighed less than 130 pounds, although 5 feet 9 inches tall. Every few weeks I would break down almost completely, and my physician would advise a long vacation, a trip to Europe or California or some other inexpensive little jaunt. Business and family cares prevented my being long away from the city, and I would pull through with tonics and willpower. One day a friend persuaded me to consult his food specialist. I did so. Under his advice, I changed radically my diet. For eight months, I ate no red meat and no white bread. I drank nothing whatever but water. Of water, I drank from 14 to 24 glasses every 24 hours. I made myself a member of the Don't Worry Club. I now weigh 155 pounds and am well in mind and body. I often work, if necessary, 12 or 14 hours at a stretch. I can eat and digest anything I please, but I do confine myself to about the diet Colonel Hunter recommends. I drink very little coffee or other stimulating beverages. I continue an exceedingly liberal use of water, but not with meals. Incidentally, I eat only about half as much as I used to, and I take no medicines. I'm not an author. Colonel Hunter is. Without my previous knowledge, he wrote Pep which sets forth just the ideas of living and the manner of mind training in which I believe. So when he offered his manuscript to the Riley and Britton Company for publication, I was delighted. Pep will help you. If you are well, it will help you keep well and live long. If you are ill or worried, Pep will help you to get well and free you from fear thought. No medicines, no drugs, mind you. If you will apply the principles of thinking and living set forth in Pep, you will be happier, healthier, and more efficient. Again, I believe in Pep. Frank Kennicott Riley Chapter 1 Pep means poise, efficiency, peace. This message is one of joy, hope, health, optimism, and good cheer. The way to serene, happy, healthful, contented life is simple, sure, and practical, and I promise that the reading of this book will help you. Follow the suggestions, and this will mark a day of destiny in your life. I shall counsel you and not preach to you. I shall be reasonable and considerate and altogether practical, for I speak from experience, not hearsay. I've been through the mill. I've had to do with worry, blues, nervousness, fear, dread, and insomnia. I've been in the darkest recesses of Shadowland and yet I've found the way to cinch up my mental and physical equipment and come into my natural heritage. Now the red blood courses through my veins, my eyes are bright, digestion good, joy is in my heart, and song is on my lips. I have an abundance of pep, which expressive little word stands for poise, pluck, peace,
power, punch, patience, purpose, so far as peas are concerned, and pep likewise means efficiency, enthusiasm, endurance, example, and experience. Pep is the foe of worry and the friend of happiness. And the ways and means to get pep I am going to explain to you so that you may have it too. We will spend a little while sizing up things together so we may understand our problems and get acquainted with each other. When I have diagnosed conditions a bit, and you find I have hit the mark, then you will have confidence. To put you at ease and free you from apprehension, I will say that our travels together will be pleasant, buoyant, and optimistic. The rules, methods, and plans will be comfortable. You will not have to be a martyr or play at heroics. There will be no starving, no freak diet rules, no strange fads, and no strenuous duties. Pep is rational, simple common sense. Mental torture and strain offsets any physical gain when the methods employed are strenuous, heroic, or extreme. Most systems of mental and physical training are extreme, faddish, and theoretical, and they soon prove discouraging. We will deal with common sense, practical, rational methods which will be in marked contrast to the involved, technical, theoretical, irrational systems of which there are so many. We shall enjoy our travels and acquaintance with each other, and I am sure you will not feel that you are taking treatment or obeying onerous discipline. We shall work with smiles all around us, and shall not heave sighs or waste time making wishes. Confidence must be yours. I shall require faith on your part when we go beyond the horizon you are familiar with. If health and happiness were the estate of the majority, there would be no call for this book. But health is scarce, and happiness most rare, because of the demands and the conventions of business and social life. We are keyed up. We must slacken up a bit and lower the tension. Here's a mental picture for you. Time never so valuable as now, coupled with ambition as a goad, is driving man to faster movement. Man is becoming a master mental dynamo, running at high-voltage nerve pressure at terrific speed, accomplishing Herculean tasks, never stopping until nature, provoked by the presumption of her liberality and insulted by the demands made of her, says stop. And then the man who has neglected care of himself and has refused good counsel wakes up to the fact that he has spent his health getting wealth, and he thereafter spends his wealth getting or trying to get back his health. Today the world looks to the future with fear and uncertainty, because civilization is becoming complex, requirements of man more grasping. The great multitude is wrestling with mammoth problems of labor, prohibition, taxes, cost of living, morality, white slavery, neurasthenia, worry, and the task of providing for a rainy day. On top of this, the selfish purpose of nearly every man is to build a monumental fortune. The cry is ever, on, on, on. The rhythm caused by the intoxication of man's mental carburetor pulsates the words, go, go, go. On life's great highway, we see the wreckage, and as the crowd presses forward, we watch the faltering ones dropping out of the race through sheer exhaustion. And so, I believe, a prophylactic against tired brains and bodies is timely, and this book will try to be that prophylactic. To help my brother to get back his pep, and to help my brother who has the pep to retain it, is the purpose of this book. To you who have thrown up the sponge, here is hope and promise that you can and will come back to your former strength of mind and body. And to you who are just commencing to feel groggy from the punches you have received, we call time, and will try to keep you in the game by a simple system of training your body and your mind. Yes, I have been through the mill, and I have tested plans, isms, cults, practices, philosophies, and after much elimination I have some rational rules and suggestions that will conserve the pep of those who have it, and bring back the pep to those who have lost it. I have a comb pile, mountain high, of theories which were thrown aside, and to save you time and investigation, I will give you the net result of the panning out, in the form of golden truth. This book is to deal in the hows, and not the whys. I take it you care to know how to get pep, rather than to know why you lost it. Chapter 2 Read about one chapter or so of this book each day. This is to establish sustained interest and fix the habit of right thinking, for right thinking is the great secret that will bring you great benefits. 
You are to receive the legacy of health and happiness, and I am co-administrator in the distribution of the legacy. There are three clauses or conditions as legatee which you must observe and agree to before you can receive your estate. I am sure the magnitude of the benefits you are to receive will cause you to play the game fairly and in proper form. First, each night, after you have undressed and prepared to retire alone in your room, free from disturbance, sit down in an easy, comfortable chair, relax your mind and body while in absolute silence for five or ten minutes you prepare yourself to receive the suggestions. Remain until all is quiet, very, very quiet. Second, now, read one or two chapters of this book carefully, slowly, earnestly, and sincerely. Get the matter you are reading in your mind and nothing else. Fasten the suggestions and helpful thoughts on your brain as you lay your head on your pillow. Go to sleep with these thoughts burned in. Third, in the morning, finish your toilet, drink two or three glasses of warm, not hot water, then reread the chapter of the night before. After breakfast, go forth to your duties and problems of the day with faith that soon you are to have strength and willpower to brush aside the things which worry, fret, and distress you. In 1896, I wrote this motto, Be pleasant every morning until ten o'clock. The rest of the day will take care of itself. And it was this thought that set me thinking on the power of suggestion. This little motto of mine is on every book I write, and it has been copied in all parts of this great round world of ours. It is easy to remember, it is very helpful, and I want you to think it or say it to yourself every morning when you arise. I make this request very urgent, for the reward you will get from the practicing of the suggestion will be very great. Now then you have the form in the manner of reading the chapters, and just as sure as you live you are going to gain each minute from now on if you play the game on the square. I ask you to have faith now. Later on you will need no urging. With this faith you must have patience. You will upset the purpose, destroy the opportunity to get benefits, if you read all this book in two or three sittings. Faith, sincerity, patience, these are the three things to keep in your mind until we get well along the road. Then confidence and clearness of vision will come to you as you rise in strength and progress. Until that time, follow me, for I know the trail, and you must accept my ways and have confidence in my plans until we get through the wilderness and strike the main road, where the path is clear and you can go it alone. In other words, do not dispute or correct the guide when you are in a strange country. Maybe you really can cut a better trail or find a shorter road later on when you are familiar with the country. But as long as you are a tenderfoot in new territory, trust to the guide and follow him on the trail which he says leads to health, happiness, and pep. You have tried your own trails. You have hoped, wished for, and sought pep, but you didn't get it. Your trails were wrong. They came back to the starting point. You are after strength, peace, poise. You want pep. You wish to be emancipated and freed from the blue devils and holdbacks. You will have your wish if you follow with faith, sincerity, and patience. I know you may have tried to get courage and strength out of a pill box or medicine bottle. You may have taken drugs, dope, tonics, culture courses, and tried systems. You may have read heavy books on mental training. You may have tried many fads, fancies, and treatments. And because you didn't get pep, you may doubt these very promises you are now reading. The man who wrote, If at first you don't succeed, try, try again, might have strengthened the suggestion by adding, But don't try the same plan. Other plans have failed. Try pep. You will listen to cold reason, I am sure. Our plan has no apparatus, isms, freak beliefs, and no drugs. You can't lose. You may win. If you do not realize your object, it hasn't cost you anything. If you get what you are after, you will have been well repaid. There you are. You can't lose. You may win. Are you with us? This is not a literary effort or a technical book. It is far from classic. It is homely English that tells its message in sure language, if not beautiful language. But it is as sincere, as honest, as truthful, as the most sacred honor and profoundest appreciation of responsibility can make it. I want to help my fellow men. There is no better purpose, no greater ambition I know of. 
doing something for somebody is the quickest way I know to plant, raise, and harvest a crop of happiness. To help you is good, and to know that this help you get will cause you to help others is much better. You see, there are ambitions higher than crowns and rewards greater than dollars. Every man or woman who reads this book and receives help from the reading is raising the world's average just so much, and to be a factor in such an uplift is reward plus. Now that we understand each other, let us square away and go to it. Chapter 3 As I will explain particularly later on, the willpower controls the mind, the mind masters the nerves, the nerves boss the muscles, the muscles drive the organs, and the whole human machine goes along merrily as nature intended it to. But when the clouds keep the sunshine out of the thinking department, and when the physical habits hamper the digestion or the functions of any of the organs, then we have congestion, and the good old doctors tell us that sickness or disease is the result of congestion. So it is that congestion of the mind, like sand in the gearbox, prevents the smooth rhythm of nature's forces, and we suffer from results caused by improper working of our God-given powers, mental and physical. It's a science worthwhile that tells us how to think, how to act, and how to live, so that we shall have happiness, strength, and efficiency. The big books in the library deal on the science of life and living, of thought and thinking. They emphasize the word efficiency. But our little everyday standby word, pep, seems to carry a meaning that better answers my purpose. Pep, I want you to understand, is efficiency plus peace and poise. Science takes certain truths as a basis, and with a delicate probe of theory searches the unknown. Finally, experience and truth and results touched by theory prove the hypothesis to be true or false. If man had always kept within the realm of the known, the story of the stars, the present perfection in fruit-raising, and the great inventions of today would be unknown. Theory paves the way to truth. It is a fine adjunct to experiment. But so much truth has been found in the study of mind and body efficiency, and life is so short that we in this book will content ourselves with applying the truth for our own benefit. We will leave the theories to our highbrow brothers in the psychological laboratories of the great colleges, where with an atmosphere of great dignity and with silver whiskers to add to that dignity, these great men may theorize and write for the masters, exploiting their theories and spreading hypotheses. And all speed to them. While they talk to the masters about theory, we will talk to the masses about truth. So we each have our place, and each have our field. We are after the whip-handle end of things, that we may control our acts, thoughts, destinies, and be masters instead of slaves. We are acute in our unrest and worries. The original man-animal had no worry, for he had no thinking brains. Civilization and convention have brought about an almost universal tendency to worry, and some new system of training, some new operations of commerce, some new ideals of life will have to be established. Worry weakens willpower, saps nerve power, unsteadies thought power, dissipates concentration, and causes a man to lose his pep. We are going to have many experiences with worry, and we are going to follow rules, suggestions, and methods which will give us grit and grip, which you see is still another way to spell pep. Whether the mind or body suffers first, both finally suffer when worry is present, because there is an inseparable affinity between mind and body. Disease is the effect of a cause. Remove the cause, and the effect disappears. The cause of most diseases is traced to wrong thought or imagination. We will try to get at some of these causes with simple bread-and-butter truths, rather than with a lot of technical scientific frosted cake, Without many whys, we will get busy with worry and recognize it as a great enemy which we shall not be able to kill. This Goliath cannot be laid low with a pebble, like that David of old shot from his sling, but we can tie him down and place him where he can't hurt us. Worry isn't a real thing. It's an imaginary demon, which looks real if we are scared. Worry is an ogre, appalling influence. Worry is the disease of the age. Worry is a dragon, a stink pot. A false face that scares people who are weak. Courage, faith, and pep are the armor, shield, and sword that makes the strong man invincible to this great make-believe, born in darkness and existing in imagination. 
gird on your armor then stand forth and say i am not afraid even as you take this step worry starts to back into its cave of darkness chapter four we will wrestle with problems one by one as we travel along together we will not classify the subjects or try to make a system or establish a science or cult in this book we take things as they come and that's a pretty good plan to adopt in your business and home affairs it will help you get along much faster i have written these chapters in the midst of a busy life and in a sort of catch-as-can manner jotting a few lines down today and some more tomorrow the one trouble that faces us most is the worry problem for it is apparent to so many of the petty troubles worry is peculiar to the human animal because the human animal is the only animal which thinks and the human being gets his thoughts twisted misplaced and clouded until he thinks worry is real when in truth worry is only imagination our thoughts are like the tides of the sea which ebb and flow in never stopping rhythm our thoughts rise on a high tide of buoyancy and joy to be followed by the reflex action or low tide and to keep your poise during the low tide is a manner of fine strategy worry is the negative or opposite to the positive peace if we are sensitive to worry it will harm us if we are sensible about worry it cannot harm us the best way to be effectually sensible about worry is to learn to make ourselves insensible to it you cannot kill worry by blows or fighting it directly you cannot rid yourself of worry by simply saying i will not worry the weapons to fight worry with are substitution strategy and elimination worry is eliminated by substitution of confidence thought we can only think one thing at a time and if we think faith or courage or joy or peace we cannot think worry thoughts at the same time remember this point well i say you cannot think two things at the same time but later on i will show you how you can do several things at the same time there is much difference between thinking and doing chapter five in their extremity many persons who are unsuccessful in establishing better thought by will-power resort to drugs little realizing what harm they are doing themselves morphine doesn't cure pain it simply deadens sensibility to pain for the time being strychnia and other deadly poisons in diluted pill or tablet form will quicken the pulse and give a feeling of exhilaration or buoyancy for the time being but at terrific cost to your physical body dope deadens the nerves to pain or intoxicates the imagination causing the mind to paint false pictures every grain of poison you take lessens your resistance shun drugs pills or tonics no good can come of them drugs cannot better your mind or physical condition nature has tonics which you will learn of later but bear in mind neither drugs nor words can cure you of any trouble that comes from inefficient mind control lack of power to think or weakness of will the cure must be made by your own self through your own mind and by your own will power i am simply the purveyor of truth the assistant the counsel the preceptor the fact is that the responsibility is upon you i will help you to reason will try to convince and show you the way but you must accept follow and practice the base on which we rest our argument is that no two objects can occupy the same space at the same time when worry occupies our thoughts all good thought is shut out when happiness is in possession worry is out worry and fear thought will keep you at high pressure and cause you to go to extremes in mental activity with faith thought confidence and poise in possession of your thinking apparatus you can slow down and conserve your energies excitement or stress of emergency runs up your nerve voltage and at such times you must pull yourself together and establish calmness and poise and slow down your governor regularity in your habits avoidance of extremes must be your rule and this will bring you to a sereneness and an ability clearly rationally and sensibly to solve problems and overcome obstacles so long as you live you will face problems it is the nature of things and the purpose of the great plan to bring out strong individuals with poise and calmness you can successfully combat all the problems which confront you for nature has given every man the equipment to assume the responsibilities he faces in life in your relation to the things of this world all your problems divide themselves into two classes one consisting of the things you can control the other the things you cannot control obviously it is footless to worry over the things you cannot control 
and time so spent is worse than wasted. The things you can control may look to be beyond your power at present, but as you go along with us you will gradually find yourselves measuring up to greater ability and power, and obstacles will diminish in size as your strength increases. So go to bed tonight with the firmly fixed thought that worry is a mental condition, that it is unreal, and cannot hurt you if you are unafraid. Worry may make horrible pictures in your dreams, your problems will be distorted and magnified, but just keep a stiff backbone and a stiff jawbone and say, I am unafraid. Do this, and even tonight you will sleep better, and surely tomorrow you will have more confidence. End of Forward, Publisher's Note, and Chapters 1 through 5. Recording by J. A. Carter. www.pleonic.com. Chapters 6 through 10 of Pep Poise, Efficiency, Peace by Colonel William Crosby Hunter. Recording by J. A. Carter. Chapter 6 Here are many things in concrete form, the details and the hows of which we will consider later on. Absorb as many of the suggestions as you can right now, and you will gain rapidly in your stock of Pep. Be calm and serene. Drink more water, more buttermilk less coffee and tea. Take more rest, sleep more, eat less. Eat more cereals, more dry toast, and less red meat. Chew your food thoroughly, eat slowly, avoid fancy foods, condiments, and highly seasoned desserts. Slow down your speed. Spend more time out of doors. Sleep with your windows wide open, winter or summer. Relax. Think faith and uplift thought. This is a pretty big bunch of rules. Follow as many of them as you possibly can. Accept the suggestions because of your faith in the guide, and upon my promise that proof of the efficacy of these suggestions will be abundant as you progress. As we shall soon clearly see, nothing comes out of our brain in thought that was not first planted in our brain. We are in mind and body what we feed upon mentally and materially. You must eliminate, so far as you possibly can, all fear and worry thought, and feed your brain on faith and joy thought. If you keep feeding on pleasant, dominant, courageous, helpful, upbuilding thought, this mental food will be digested and you will realize great benefits. Patience here again is the word, for you may not notice instant gain in your mental strength any more than you recognize quick results in physical strength following a substantial meal. Think good, see good, hear good, mix with good, and have patience. You cannot cut down a tree with one stroke of an axe. Figuratively, we have locked arms, clasped hands, looked into each other's eyes, felt each other's hearts, and given each other our confidence. I want you to feel that these thoughts are personal, human, and not mere printed words. I want you to feel there is a joyous, helpful camaraderie between us as we go along, finding sunshine and health and spreading joy into shadow land. We are helping ourselves, and we are helping others who need us. Truth and evidence shall be our basis, and we must be wide awake, alert, and receptive. We will forget how often we fell asleep over those heavy old scientific books, written by thin-blooded men who have never been in the fray, men who have never felt as you and I have felt. Those men write theory. We are practicing truth. The housewife doesn't care for tables and tests, information about yeast ferments, heat units, bacilli culture. She wants to know how much flour, water, salt, yeast, heat, and time to use, and in what proportion, so that she may bake bread. You do not care for a glossary of words or an array of scientific terms, or pictures of neurons, ganglia, nerve centers, etc., etc., ad nauseum. We will have to do with the practical ways by which you may substitute sereneness for worry, smiles for frowns, joys for sorrows, health for illness, strength for weakness, courage for fear, hope for despair, love for hate, kindness for cruelty, gentleness for roughness, friendship for enmity, charity for selfishness. Chapter 7 
We are planting seeds and learning about the weeds which kill the flowers, so that we may destroy the weeds. Henceforth, when opportunity offers, and when you can make opportunity, think about the flowers and the beauty and the good things of life. It will be harder to point your compass aright and steer true to this course now than it will be later. I could have given you the definite rules to follow on one or two pages of this book, and very little good would have come to you. The parent could tell the child the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule, and within those eleven rules and suggestions practically the great guides to morals and living could be found. The teacher could give the basic rules of arithmetic, reading, and writing, and the pupil would have the basis for a life's work. But good, so far as it has to do with the shaping of our lives, our morals, or our educations, must be brought out by sustained and continued application and attention. Don't you see, then, why it is better for you and me to travel slowly along, rather than to have me tell you the story in a few words? Can't you see how it will benefit you if you keep this book ever near you, after you have finished it in the form laid out? By reading a chapter or so every day, in the manner suggested, you are going to fasten habit until it is firmly fixed, and your good thought will work automatically. Again, I ask patience, for clouds will come to you, despair will creep in, but each day, if patience and persistence is your rule, you are weakening the enemies to your sereneness. The shipbuilding yard looks like a gigantic jackstraw puzzle. We cannot appreciate how order is to come out of such chaos. Lots of time and patience have been expended in preparing the plates, bars, bolts, and rods. Some day, the mastermind who laid out these plans will issue the orders, and these thousands of pieces will be carried to the stocks, each finding its place, and a great ship will appear. There was a lot of preparation, a lot of patience necessary. So, with your task, patience and sincerity in the study of the parts, plans, and conditions are necessary, and when assembly time comes, you will surely realize great benefits. Chapter 8 The food you have been receiving is easily digestible. I have tried to be serious and hold your interest, and if you have followed closely, I am sure that as you have been reading these lines, worry and unrest were absent. We are getting acquainted and understanding each other. You are taking the easier steps in preparatory work now, and each day there will be new pleasures, new hopes, and new strength for you. I am sure the sunshine is breaking through the clouds. You are getting strength, and I now pull aside the curtain a bit and let you take a peep at the enemy and point out the problems we are to tackle. We shall not rush on the enemy like a cavalry charge, but we will pick them off one by one with strategy, punch, and strength. We will wallop them with substitution until the enemy's camp ground is overgrown with flowers where the weeds were thick, and the fort of the enemy where with flying colors and seeming impregnable security the enemy held forth shall be turned into a cemetery of the vanquished horde. Behold, then, before our fight, camping yonder, under the ever-alert general, worry, the enemy. Blues, nervousness, melancholy, nervous prostration, short breath, forgetfulness, sensitiveness, nightmare, blurred eyesight, lost confidence, uncertainty, fear, neuritis, hysteria, rapid pulse, dizziness, lonesomeness, nervous dyspepsia, indigestion, listlessness, dread, neurasthenia, despondency, hardened arteries, trembling, crying spells, lost ambition, loss of weight, timidity, and others. I have not mentioned many physical diseases that are aggravated by worry and nerve weakness. Practically every ill the body suffers, if not directly caused by worry, is certainly aggravated by worry or lack of mind control. The one thing to relieve the conditions caused by worry is to substitute right thinking and establish the ability to keep up right thought. You must get in helpful thoughts and shut out hurtful thoughts. Helpful thoughts bring strength. Hurtful thoughts cause weakness and hypochondria, and this condition is the forerunner to the ogres we have just been looking at. Set your energy to work on making and keeping the resolve that you are going to put your willpower in command of your nerves, which are the telegraph lines of the body. From now on you must recognize that mind is to master your body and that your willpower is to direct the mind. Your resolve will make you stronger in your purpose, and each day you will find your vision clearer and your power to concentrate your thoughts easier. Think courage. Repeat the words, Nothing can harm me as long as I am unafraid. 
It has taken years, perhaps, of steady pull at your nerves to bring you into a state of weakened power mentally and physically. If you have lost your confidence, combativeness, and pep, it has been a slow process, and you cannot expect by mere resolve to reinstate your former strength and normal condition on the instant. You will require patience, and lots of it, but you can well afford to be patient, for you are now on the upward turn and gaining in strength every day. Your patience will yield you wonderful dividends. Of course, if you have been taking drugs, dope, tonics, or bracers, you will quit them instantly. They are only temporary boosters, and the reflex after the drug effect always leaves you worse than ever. Drugs and dope push you downward. Faith and hope lift you upward. There are twenty-four hours in a day, and fourteen hundred and forty minutes. If you can master yourself by right thinking for five minutes today, tomorrow you can be master for six or seven minutes, and each day you can increase the length of the period of your mastery. There never would be any photographs unless there were shadows and lights. We need reverses in our lives to make us appreciate our blessings. In times of prosperity, we have a large circle of individuals who pose as friends and are extravagant with their offers of friendship, until when necessity, through reverses, causes us to try to cash in this friendship, we find the friends scattered like a bunch of sheep with a hungry coyote in their midst. Your need should be your inventory time for then you can make a little memorandum book of who is who when you need a friend. Do not presume upon friends to help you. They serve their purpose temporarily to bridge you over difficulties. Friends can help you by their good cheer and counsel, by their help and suggestions, but the real help is within you, and to get pep it is necessary that you make the fight alone. I am acting as a friendly architect, drawing plans for you who are to do the building, Having furnished the specifications and drawings, my principal part of the work is ended, and the responsibility for the structure is up to you. I shall come around often and watch your progress, and I shall be with you in thought and good wishes, and with words of cheer which will help you to sing as you work. CHAPTER Nine. You must overcome obstacles singly, and not look upon them in mass, as you will be discouraged if you do. Take one thing at a time, dispose of it, tackle the next thing, and so on. Success comes slowly. It creeps. Your hunger for success makes you wish that progress would come jumping along like a kangaroo. From my ranch house in Frozen Dog, Idaho, I see the frowning range of the Seven Devils Mountains. It looks as though it would be impossible to get over that range, but I have been over it. I hit the trail, walk step by step around bends, over rocks, resting once in a while to refresh myself and replenish my energy. As I looked back from the resting place, the very ground over which I had passed looked as forbidding as the hills ahead of me, but the fact that I had gone so far gave me confidence that I could go further, and I did. Your problems are like those hills. Keep on your way, rise slowly, surely, and go forward, no matter how slowly you go, just so you are moving in the right direction. Let a song be on your lips and happiness in your heart, and the journey will be easier. The troubles you have had in the past are greater than any troubles you will have in the future. The things you expected to floor you in the past did not happen. You may be hemmed in now, and the walls around you may look impassable, but keep your head up and keep climbing. Your loved ones are watching your progress. Their warm hearts respond to your joy and sympathize with you, and if you give them hand clasps of cheer and words of courage, you will help them, and more certainly, help yourself. If you cannot be sincere in speaking or acting courage and cheer, act these things anyway. Your happiness may be forced, your smile may be make-believe, your example may be posing. Be it so. Keep on the acting. It will help those you love, and finally, sincerity will mix with your insincerity, and the good impulses will be real and natural. The old man said, Most of my worries have been about things which never happened. Your worries are mostly about anticipated horrors or conditions you expect to find in the future. But your anticipation will not be realized. Those troubles will not occur. You always came out right in the past, some way, somehow. You managed to get through and came out on top. Patrick Henry said, I know of no way to judge the future but by the past. Just apply that rule in your own case. Faith is your rose. Worry is the thistle. Both are fighting for room. 
Worry wishes to kill faith. Faith struggles so hard to live. Water the faith, Rose. Care for it. Keep the thistle down. With faith established, peace, joy, and cheer will come to you. Stand by the rose of faith. Watch out for it. Keep the thistle down, and watch out for new thistle seeds. They grow quickly. Chapter 10 The printer must know about type, paper, and ink. The carpenter must know about the hammer, saw, and plane. The preacher must know his Bible, prayer books, and hymns. So, in order to get the good out of you, you must know about the things which are in you and the tools you have to work with. The principal tool is the brain. The brain is the thought factory and the dynamo which gives impulse to the nerves. The nerves are the overseers or taskmasters of the muscles. It would take a whole library alone to tell in detail about the brain, to show proofs and diagrams necessary to give the ordinary layman a complete understanding of the brain. But I am not to be technical, and you have agreed to have faith and believe the things I tell you, and really it doesn't matter very much whether I tell you the full truth or not, so long as you get the results you are after. Plant corn in May, cultivate the ground carefully, and in the fall each kernel will produce hundreds of kernels. That is truth, and it is not necessary to go into scientific terms or give botanical explanation of the process of growing. It is sufficient to know that by doing what you are told, the result you are after is sure to follow. In other words, when I tell you about planting the corn and cultivating the ground, and promise that you will reap a crop, I am talking from experience, and promising you the results, because I know that the formula and the suggestion given you will produce definite results. If you are too insistent, you can go to the library, or consult the best doctor or the best scholar you know, and find that the things I say are true. I haven't time to take side roads or quote authorities, so just dismiss your doubt and bear patiently as we go along. Have confidence in this book until you have finished it, and see how the thing comes out. The brain is the thought factory, or better still, it is the business office of the body. The brain is likewise a battery, a key, a carburetor, an engine, a dynamo, a chart room. The nerves running out of the business office are the telegraph wires carrying the vital spark from the business office. Some of these nerves work automatically, and some of them get busy only when we order them to work. Part of the brain controls the nerves which work the heart, the digestion, the circulation, and the breathing. These nerves work right along without wasting any nerve energy, and without requiring any mental effort. You cannot stop the working of the heart or the digestion by any mental effort. You can suspend certain automatic nerve action temporarily, such as stopping the eye-winking muscles or the breathing muscles. You cannot, by any mental effort, refrain from seeing things when your eyes are open. You cannot stop feeling, smelling, tasting, or hearing by mental effort. A continuation of the brain runs down the hollow of the backbone and is known as the spinal cord. It is a sort of assistant brain, or magneto. It relieves the main office of much of the most important work and takes care of a great deal of the common work. For instance, when you desire to walk, the brain sets certain muscles to work through the nerves. The impetus is given, and the start is made by definite action of the brain. After you have made the start, the brain switches the job to the spinal cord, and the spinal cord keeps the walking muscles working until you wish to stop. So then, in the operation of walking, the brain is used at the start and at the finish. The spinal cord takes care of the nerve action necessary between the time of starting and the time of stopping. This is a wonderful provision of nature, for it saves the using of the brain force for the common work of the body. I can illustrate this very nicely by comparing your brain and spinal cord to the dry cell battery and the magneto in an automobile, and comparing you, the human machine, with the automobile. You start an automobile with a dry cell battery, and when the engine is running smoothly, you switch the current to the magneto. The magneto furnishes the spark without loss and keeps the engine running without using up any of the original dry cell current. If your automobile ran all the while on the battery, the battery would soon lose its voltage and finally peter out altogether. So with the human machine. If you had to think and use your brain for every step you took, for every breath or every movement, you would soon wear out your brain. It is because many of you use the brain for much unimportant work that there is so much nerve exhaustion. End of chapter 6 through 10. Recording by J. A. Carter. 
www.pleonic.com. Chapters 11 through 15 of Pep, Poise, Efficiency, Peace, by Colonel William Crosby Hunter. Recording by J. A. Carter. Chapter 11. There are many things the spinal cord, or magneto, is used for without having to call on the brain, or dry cell battery. For instance, when you close your eye, cough, sneeze, vomit, or jump away from heat or pain, or hits, or shocks, or noise. The more you use the dry cell battery, the sooner you exhaust its voltage. You must recharge the battery with sleep, rest, and by the elimination of conscious effort upon everything you do. Just as the nerve action goes on without stopping in the matter of controlling heartbeats, so a certain something goes on without stopping in the matter of controlling thought. From your first moment of consciousness, your brain has been in constant activity in generating thought, or causing mental pictures or ideas to follow one another continuously without a moment stopping. Even when you are asleep, the thought action runs along just the same, although the remembrance or the impression of the thought may have vanished. So, as it is impossible to stop thought, we must consider the scientific way of directing that thought. The brain, on the one hand, is a generator of thought, and on the other, it is an organ of thought. And if we keep in mind the brain as an organ of thought, just as the stomach is the organ of digestion, we shall be able to find many practical ways to use the organ as subservient to our will. You can make your brain, as an organ, cause you to walk, talk, see, hear, eat, smell, feel, all at the same time, but you cannot make your brain think two things at once, any more than you can speak two words at once. I want to repeat, you can do many things at once, but you can think but one thing at a time. When your mind is occupied with fear thoughts, you cannot think faith thoughts. One or the other must dominate. While you have been reading this chapter, you have not worried, because your mind was not on yourself, but upon what I hope has been helpful, inspiring, uplifting, and interesting thought. Your brain will do wonderful things for you if you look upon it as an organ or servant of your thought. It will respond to your will power, and your will power must be directed toward cultivating a natural habitual ability to keep peace thought in the chair as much as possible. I must repeat this suggestion and emphasize again the importance of it. You are after poise, efficiency, and peace. Note that the first letter of each of these words spells pep. And the way to get this good is the substitution of the good thought and the elimination of the fear thought. The world is to you just as you are to the world. Think good, act good, be good, and crowd out the bad. The more you feed your brain on good, the surer you are to get good thoughts out of it. Chapter 12 We don't know what life is. The secret has not been told. We don't know just what the soul is or its relation to the brain. But we know there are many ties of relationship between life and soul and mind. We do not know what space is or just what the stars are, nor can we tell just how plants grow. But we know many truths about space and stars and plants. We haven't the full knowledge of electricity yet. But the knowledge we have of electricity is mighty useful to us. Every day we are learning new truths and applying them to our benefit. When the first telegraph message was sent, it was a world marvel that Morse could send intelligence over a wire. He sent a single message. It was a reverent message, and a high tribute to the faith of the inventor of the telegraph. The message was, What hath God wrought? Now we have improved on the telegraph. The average person doesn't know, perhaps, that we have a multiplex instrument that will send several messages over the same wire at the same time. And not only this, some of these messages may be sent one way and some another simultaneously. Think of that. Two messages going east and two going west at the same time on the same wire without getting mixed. The brain uses the nerves very much like the multiplex instrument, as we have shown in the previous chapter because it will make us do a great many things at the same time. But when it comes to thought, there can be but one thought at a time. To be strong mentally and to have good thoughts, you must be active mentally and train your thoughts on strength, courage. 
If you slow down or let your mind wander in side paths or on trivial things, it will get you back to worry and fear and dread and self-condemnation. Your mind is like a young colt. It rebels at first at any semblance of training. But later on, if you keep the reins well in your hand, you can guide the mind into the habit of right thinking. Mind is the master, and it controls your body, and you will feel happy or you will have worry in proportion as the mind is working through right or wrong impulse. Mind is master. It can and will drive away blues, worry, and the attendant ailments which come from fear thought and mind lethargy and mind abuse. Mind is master, and it can and will drive away ills and despair which come from wrong thinking and wrong physical acts. What profitable study is this which shows us how to throw sunshine into shadowland, to brighten and cheer and attain courage and hope? You are going to be happy, this I promise you. You are going to get rid of worry and to learn that you can master yourself. You are going to be constant in your determination to put good things in your brain to supplant the bad thought that is trying to fasten itself upon you. These things you are going to do, and I hope you are doing some of them now. When you get blue, switch the current of your thought to faith thought. Go to a cheerful friend, talk of blessings instead of hard luck, make your mind travel in another path. Fear no evil. Worry is not real. Nothing can harm you but bad thoughts, so don't let the bad thoughts in. Every time you make this resolve, every time you read this suggestion which I am repeating so often, will you get added help and strength. Chapter 13 We are built up in mind and body from the nourishing mental and physical food we take in. The stomach does not make food, but digests food. The heart does not make blood, but it pumps blood around our bodies. The eyes do not make pictures. They merely photograph or reflect lights and shadows coming into the eye and impress these things upon the nerves, which carry impressions to the brain. The brain does not make thought, but it digests and analyzes impressions and coordinates ideas. The brain is the storage battery, the digester, the telegraph key, the record keeper, the filing cabinet, the index of thoughts, ideas, impressions, and sensibilities. In the infant, the brain is a clean white page, and everything that will ever come out of that child's brain must first come into it and make the impression. From childhood, impressions, ideas, and intelligences are constantly arriving, and they are permanently established in the brain, where, in company with other thoughts, they germinate or hatch out new ideas. That is, we think the ideas are new, but the ideas have come into our mind in one form, and like chemical change which makes an apparently new substance, so thoughts changed in the mental laboratory make apparently new ideas. You cannot shoot a gun until you load it. What you put in the gun is a few grains of black powder and a fulminating cap. When you press the trigger, you hear a noise, see fire and smoke, and perhaps can feel the heat. What comes out of the gun has no semblance to what went in it, but that which came out was simply a changed form of that which went in. The thing we consider a new idea is merely a changed shape of a former idea which we put into the brain, and coming out now into our intelligence and understanding in a new form. Through our senses of seeing, feeling, hearing, etc., we are constantly receiving impressions which are carried to our brain, where they associate, intertwine, and amalgamate to come out oft-times seemingly as newborn ideas from our brain. In concrete, I want you to remember particularly this. Nothing comes out of the brain but what went in first. You cannot draw out good thoughts if you feed your brain on bad thoughts. Your brain is a garden in which there are roses and weeds struggling for possession. If you let the roses get the worst of it, the weeds will quickly thrive. You must put in good thoughts and nourish those good thoughts and be vigilant in eliminating the bad thoughts from your mental garden. Whenever a bad thought comes or when worry surrounds you, Set your willpower at work, and if necessary, force yourself to think helpful thoughts. Say, I am not afraid. I shall not worry, because worry is unreal, a make-believe. I shall not even think of the word worry. You are free. You have your place in the world. You are master of your thoughts. Your will will serve you. You must fear no evil. The weeds will die if you keep all your attention on nourishing the flowers. Since you have been traveling with me in this book, and have had alternate periods of buoyancy and reflexes of blues, you must not take this as discouragement. Every day you think and act and follow the suggestions in this book, 
you are putting happiness checks in your reserve bank i do not want to touch the heartstrings or write weepy lines or quivering words to show my sympathy for my message is cheer joy and smiles i have these blessings and i have promised that you shall have them too when the atmosphere gets blue and you feel miserable don't give way to your feelings but get out your mental brush and dip it in the paint pot of courage and with the rosy paint blot out the blue spots you're all right cheer up the very fact that you are alive is a great thing i know of a woman who had six children she had rheumatism and st vitus dance at the same time she had no money no friends but somehow or other she had pep and grit and she came out all right and i understand occasionally she has pie for breakfast so i guess you needn't worry you will never improve your game of billiards if you play with inferiors you will never improve your optimism if you chastise yourself by comparing your weak points with the strong points of others instead of suffering by being envious of others who have more material things than you have you should get satisfaction and comfort in looking at the greater miseries and sorrows of others less fortunate than you and that will help you toward contentment chapter fourteen i hope you are keeping faith and sincerely trying to hold your thoughts in proper channels this chapter is a chapter of promise good cheer and concrete suggestion have you spoken a kind word to-day have you done a kind deed or performed an act worth while i am going to put down your answer as yes and then say aren't you happy because of your acts while you were thinking of others it took your mind off yourself you know that your troubles are largely due to the fact that you have given yourself too much importance and used too much of your thought for your own selfish purpose in proportion as you cultivate the ability to drop this selfishness in the matter of thought you will be able to free yourself from the tangles of worry you must think of others you must consider them you must do things for them you must get yourself out of yourself or you will be narrow uncharitable envious and miserable and the longer these conditions exist the harder it will be to change your makeup think of your blessings of the needs of others of the opportunities to help them and cut out envy slow down cultivate calmness do not push haste makes double work eliminate unnecessary moves avoid excitement so that your heart will work normally i promise you great happiness and joy if you will follow these suggestions and do the things not simply from duty but with enthusiasm vim and energy as you go along each day will be clearer the clouds will pass as you grasp the sunshine truth the ugly mental pictures will be replaced with pictures beautiful to look upon every day worry will be lessened joy increased i promise you happiness in your heart song on your lips smiles on your countenance and an ecstasy for the very life privilege which perhaps you formerly thought was not worth the while is life worth living asks the pessimist well i guess it is it is grand it is here for your enjoyment the plan of things is right the world is getting better and you are going to help in the uplift we must have some clouds and sorrows even as a dog has fleas clouds are here for a purpose a little darky was sitting on a curb hitting his head with a stick asked why he did such a thing he replied it feels so good when i stop i understand those who live in the land of perpetual sunshine and uniform temperature get mighty tired of sameness so when the little annoyances come consider them as trifles and know that they come to you simply to accentuate the joys and pleasures you have here are a few capsules of optimism essence repeat these thoughts nothing can harm me but my thoughts and i have control of my thoughts i am going to look up not down i am here for a purpose that purpose is to make the very best of conditions that exist sometimes i did not look at things rightly but the world is right i am to enjoy the blessing of life and i am to help others to enjoy life too tomorrow morning i am going to promise myself that i will be pleasant until ten o'clock anyway chapter fifteen i make a guess that today averaged better with you than yesterday because i feel sure each day is one of progress and that you are gaining in the control of your will power and in the betterment of your thought with this confidence and belief we will get down to our little study again and see some more interesting things about the powers and uses of the brain under control of the mind remembering that the purpose of spending so much time on the brain is to establish the fundamental truth which i am trying to weave all through this book 
that mind is the master of matter. As you are in thought, so is the world to you. Your whole circle of friends, your home, and everything with which you come in contact changes aspect with every change in your mood or view. If the weather be dark and gloomy, you will not feel as joyful or optimistic as you do when the sunshine comes. The mind is the keynote to your feelings, and controls your functions and your organs and your general health. You are what you think you are, and I shall show by illustration how true this is. You may be sitting at the table ready to eat, and your appetite is very keen. Let someone tell you bad news or bring you a telegram announcing the illness or death of a dear one, and your appetite instantly vanishes. Let someone tell a disgusting story or speak of disagreeable things, and your appetite flies away. You have often noticed how you turn away from your meal if someone near you clears his throat, or coughs, or blows his nose, or makes queer noises in eating. I do not like to speak of these things, but they illustrate so clearly how positively the nerves are under control of the mind, and will affect your senses, your appetite, and your enjoyment. Mind is the master, and you know it. The question, therefore, before you is how to cultivate the mind, so that it will measure up to its proper function in dominating worry, troubles, or ailments which bother you. There are some very helpful lessons or truths ahead for you, some of them pleasant, and some of them bitter pills for you to swallow. Do not be impatient. Impatience is one of the things which made you worry. We are going along comfortably, slowly, and surely, to make you patient. When you are impatient, you see things in a false light. You magnify trifles, you dignify non-essentials, and you befog the beauty around you. You remember as a child or youngster what horrible nightmares, bad dreams, and sleepless nights you passed, following evenings spent in telling ghost stories, relating murder or robber tales. You recall how the rustle of the branches against your house, or the whistling wind or creaking hinge, suggested burglars, spooks, or other terrors to you. Your mind was feeding on fear thought instead of faith thought. You remember in the morning, when the sun shone brightly and you went into the open air, how differently things looked, and how much better you felt, for the horrible nightmare had passed away. There is an old illustration which shows how fear thought affects the mind and body. It is this. I have a few friends, by agreement, posted that they will all tell a certain one on a certain day he is looking bad. We will call the subject George. George goes out in the morning in perfect health and in high spirits. He meets A, who says, How pale you look, George. Then comes B, who says, Are you ill? And so on. The other actors in the play follow one after another, each one telling George he does not look well or asking him if he's ill. By the time five or six have made the suggestion of illness, George is really sick. As a matter of fact, he is sick because he thinks he is, and he thinks he is because the sick thought has been suggested to him so much that he believes it. A certain attorney purchased a new hat. One of his friends telephoned to other friends that whenever they met the attorney they should ridicule his hat. The lawyer started down the street with his head up, with consciousness and comfortableness and the feeling that he was strictly in style and had a becoming hat, until he met a friend, A, who said, Where in the world did you get that hat? Later on came B, who said, What's the matter? Have you traded hats with someone? In turn came C, who said, You've certainly chosen an ill-looking hat. And so, one after another, spoke to the attorney about his hat, until he went back to his office, threw his hat in the wastebasket, never to wear it again. As a matter of fact, the hat cost five dollars. It was a good hat, and it was becoming. But the constant suggestion of friends so worked on the mind of the lawyer that he was convinced his hat was attracting attention and did not look right. The foregoing illustration is not made to order. It is an actual occurrence which came within my observation. By brooding or thinking fear thoughts, you can work yourself into a bad state and really feel that ailments and ills are real, tangible things, so far as you are concerned. Mind is the master, and your insurance against pullbacks is to see to it that the mind does master. If constant suggestion for evil makes you think evil, so constant suggestion for good makes you think good. Did you do a kind act today? Have you driven another peg in your ability to make your mind do what your will wants it to? Are you feeling more strength and confidence as these suggestions are made to you? End of chapters 11 through 15 Recording by J. A. Carter www.pleonic.com
Chapters 16 through 20 of Pep, Poise, Efficiency, Peace, by Colonel William Crosby Hunter. Recording by J. A. Carter. Chapter 16. For ages, the study of the mind and its control over matter has occupied the attention of the world's greatest thinkers and philosophers. Today there is a popular wave sweeping the country under the name of New Thought. The words New Thought seem to suggest that there is a modern discovery of truth, when, as a matter of fact, all the great truths that are being told by this so-called New Thought are simply old truths worked over again. This applies also to the essential truths of Christian science. King David, Solomon, Plato, Socrates, Confucius, and the philosophers who lived centuries ago told the plain, helpful truths which today are being passed off as new thought. During the Dark Ages, the people lived in a benighted state. They would not believe or absorb simple truth, and consequently mystery, superstition, charms, and fetishes were looked upon as the power to help, and the methods by which relief from illness could be had. As the world became enlightened, Gradually the old truths became re-established, and now there are hundreds of isms, cults, religions, and sects which have, within the past few years, sprung into popularity, and the basis upon which these various beliefs or teachings are founded is the old glorious truths dressed up and passed off as something entirely new. But all philosophers, whether ancient or modern, agree that the mind controls the body, and through the nerves has intimate relation with its organs and functions. Every part of your body, including the brain, is made up of tiny cells which are being built up and broken down every minute of your life. Every move you make, every thought you think, destroys certain cells, and wonderful nature, if unhampered in its operation, sees to it that repair for the waste is made. The brain is the organ of the mind, as I have pointed out, just as truly as the stomach is the food organ and the heart, lungs, are organs in their respective offices. The nerves are the connecting wires over which the mind sends its orders and receives the incoming messages from every part of the body. I will give you some more practical illustrations showing the control of mind over matter. If you see a person whistling or playing a flute or coronet, stand in front of the player and suck a lemon. The mere sight of this will make it impossible for the performer to play, because the suggestion of the lemon means puckering of lips, and the thought works on the nerves controlling the muscles which make the mouth pucker. You pass by an open door where sirloin steak and onions are being cooked, and the odor, through the sensory nerves of smell, telegraphs the hunger sensation to the brain, and a mental picture is formed, an appetite created, until your mouth waters, as the saying is. That it waters is not fancy, but a real physical fact, for the hunger desire kindled by the odor causes the brain to order the salivary glands to prepare digestive juices for the expected food, and your mouth feels the water or saliva coming from the base of the tongue where the salivary glands are located. When you receive a shock, your skin turns cold, and this may be followed with alternate sweats or chills. If you are nauseated or seasick, the mention of fat, pork, or olive oil will be sufficient to cause you to feed the fishes. I could give you countless illustrations like these, showing how false suggestion will generate fear, and how your feelings are directly the results of your thoughts. Again, I bring this thought to you, that the one thing to do when you are under stress of worry is to change your thoughts to something else. When you think depressing thought, get your mind on cheerful things. Talk to someone whose very presence calms you. Read humorous stories. Listen to cheerful music. Employ any means you can to change the train of your thought. Study how you may help someone. Think of a person who suffers more than you do, who would be helped by your word of sympathy and cheer. Go out among the flowers. Cut the lawn. Fix the rusty gate. Repair the door latch. Take a tempting dish to a sick friend. Talk to some aged person, show interest in some lonely friend whom others neglect. Help your wife undress the babies or tell stories to the babies while she's busy. There are hundreds of ways to occupy your mind with useful things when it commences to think useless, footless, hurtful things. If you keep your mind occupied with good stuff, the bad thoughts can't come in. Now for our little review of the day. Have you done a kind act or a good deed? Have you helped someone? I hope you have. But anyway, promise here and now, before you go to sleep, that when you awake, you will keep in your thought that you are to do a good deed, a kind act, to speak a word of sympathy and good cheer, and tomorrow night, 
You will have a sweet pleasure and happiness as you open this book, and I will feel it too. Let tomorrow be a special day in this resolve. I just feel you are ready to cash in a lot of happiness from my suggestion. So good night, sweet dreams to you, and don't forget your promise that tomorrow you are going to help someone. Chapter 17 We shall consider hypochondria, which is a frequent result of worry thought. Hypochondria is the state of imagining disease which does not exist, and sometimes it is the constant dwelling on a lesser ailment in the imagination that the ailment is a serious thing. As far back as Buddha's time, we learn that, quote, all that we are is the result of what we have thought, unquote. That is the same truth in another form, which appears in the Bible, quote, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he, unquote. The poor hypochondriac imagines he has disease. He feeds on that thought, and the thought thrives until the sufferer is miserable and a slave to drugs and medicines. Every doctor knows that if all medicines were prohibited by law, people would get well, and as Dr. Oliver Wendell Holmes said, quote, very likely the people would live longer, unquote. The doctor knows the power of mind over matter, and personally he believes in it, but he cannot afford to express the truth in full to his patient, for the doctor commercializes mystery and benefits in proportion as he writes prescriptions. Nevertheless, the doctor, by suggestion, gets or tries to get the mental attitude of the patient right. The doctor comes in with his cheery countenance, his words of courage, suggestion of hope, evidence of sympathy, and promise of help. These are the things that help the patient more than the prescription. I do not decry or belittle the use of antiseptics or drugs for acute troubles or contagious diseases. I am speaking now of hypochondria, and trying to make it clear to you that you cannot get relief from hypochondria out of a bottle, but you can get it from mental suggestion. When the doctor treats the hypochondriac, it's not the medicine, but the faith in the medicine, faith in the doctor and the confidence in the doctor's promise that does the good. Hypochondria predisposes you to the very thing you fear. What you sow, you will reap. If you sow fear thoughts, you will reap fear. If you think you have disease, you will suffer as though you really had the disease. If you are in dread of catching cold, very likely you will often have colds. When you get the ability to dominate your mental self, you will not suffer through fear. The person who is always bundling up and fussing around with overshoes and scarves is the one who most frequently has colds. There is a close relationship between the fear of catching cold and the physical act of bundling up to prevent the cold. I have often been out in a boat all day with my feet wet. I have walked through mud, exposed myself to dampness, and been in the downpouring rain, and come home at night without catching a cold. I have seen others who seem to catch a cold if they walk out in the dew. I had no fear of cold. I did not catch cold. Last year the women wore high collars and fancy fluffs and things around their necks. This year the style is low necks, low neck dresses, like the simple old style our mothers knew. And so far as I can see and learn, there are less colds and throat troubles among the women this year than last. The women have learned that confidence and care will prevent colds. Chapter 18 Countless millions of little cells are the units which make our body. And just as one individual or one apple is liable to spoil others with which it comes in contact, so the bad cells of the body quickly exert bad influence. The blood is busy every minute of the day and night carrying off dead and broken down cells and bringing new cells to take the places of the old ones. The blood comes from the food you take in. There are three kinds of food necessary to human life, air, water, and material substance. How important, therefore, it is that the air you breathe, the water you drink, and the food you eat shall be of the quality and quantity to bring the best results. Good food is impaired in its life-giving value if the mind is working improperly, because the food does not get the right secretions for its digestion. Some keen observer said that most Americans who had died had dug their graves with their teeth, and there is much truth in this statement. We all eat too much. We require about our own weight in food each month, or about 3% of our weight each day. I shall not impose upon you any rules of diet. Generally speaking, you should be able to eat what you like, but the one thing to keep in mind is that we all eat too much, and this imposes extra work on the digestive organs. It builds up fat, 
and the fat requires the building of a lot of extra veins that makes just so much more work for the heart. The human engine is very elastic in its power. It can do a prodigious amount of work, and nature has arranged that in such cases the human engine can consume large quantities of food and take care of it properly. The trouble with most men is that they keep their hundred horsepower boilers going to full capacity when the work required only calls for fifteen horsepower energy. The matter of taste and savor nearly always prejudices us in favor of seasoned foods and sweet dishes. We eschew the very things we should chew. That is, we take pastry, soft, easily swallowed, pleasant-tasting food for our meals instead of roughage, and the roughage is necessary to keep the alimentary tract in good condition. Eat plainer foods, frequently eat dry toast, but do not soften it with liquid food. Chew the toast thoroughly, for this causes the salivary glands to act and helps the digestive process. If you are thin and require fat, eat bacon in the morning, but do not have it fried to a crisp, for that means the fat, the very thing you're after, has been eliminated, and you're only taking in the least nourishing part of the bacon. Remember that eggs, milk, and whole wheat contain all the things necessary for the human body. Buttermilk is a splendid drink. Coffee I won't say much about that, because I do not wish to raise a rumpus. I will meet you halfway with this proposition. Drink coffee for breakfast, buttermilk or sweet milk for the other two meals. Eat plenty of fruit, especially prunes and apples. In eating apples, do not commit the unpardonable crime against nature of peeling the apple before you eat it. The skin contains the phosphorus, the phosphates, and the real brain material of the apple. Remember, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Try my way for a month of eating very much less than you have been eating. And it won't hurt you very much if you cut out the noonday meal altogether and take a good walk and eat an apple or two in place of your regular luncheon. Be regular in your meals. Avoid late-night suppers. Do not eat meat over once a day, and preferably mutton or chicken. I do not count the bacon you eat for breakfast, but I refer to heavy meats in quantities. When you are in a healthy, normal condition and get plenty of exercise each day, you will not have to bother much about what you have to eat. Those who are run down and suffering from indigestion or dyspepsia should consult a doctor as to the proper diet. The object I have in writing this book is to get you normally right, so that you can do pretty much as you like. I cannot give you any better or more truthful suggestion in the matter of food than these three rules. Eat less eat slowly, eat plainer food. It goes without saying that the law of temperance applies here. That is, if you are run down and are eating a minimum amount of food, then of course the injunction to eat less does not apply. Chapter 19 When the stomach is affected, the result is either from physical cause or mental cause, very likely the latter. In either case, when the stomach is affected, the work it performs is of inferior quality, the work of the stomach is to extract the life-giving properties from the food you eat, and these properties are distributed through the body by the blood. If the stomach does not perform its office as nature intended, then the blood suffers, and consequently the whole system is impaired. We need nourishing food to give us storage, energy, and recuperative powers. Fatigue follows exertion, and fatigue is the result of overworked muscles or overworked nerves. When the fatigue is from nervous overdraft, it produces mental drowsiness. The brain gets sluggish, the whole body is out of sorts, until the repair crew brings vitalized cells to take the place of the destroyed cells. This is nature's plan to repair waste and to recharge exhausted energy. But when nature is presumed upon and insulted by the continued overdraft on her reserve, something has to give, and that something is the nervous system. Overworked muscles can be speedily restored by proper rest while the repair is going on, but overworked nerves are not so easily repaired. You must watch out and be careful not to overtax the nerves, for weakened nerve force affects the secretions of the body. Every cell in your anatomy is directly responsible to right thought. If the brain is not working properly, the entire system suffers. When you get your mind in supreme control of your body, you have built up a resistance, a reserve strength, and a power that makes you tingle with the very joy of living, and you will have no time to stop and argue over the pessimistic question, is life worth living? Every disease, of course, has a definite cause. 
Sometimes we find that the cause we see is merely a cause resting upon another cause. The pill may temporarily relieve constipation, a sweat may break up a cold, pepsin may digest your dinner, but below all these troubles there is impaired nervous action, and the permanent cure or relief will not come until the mind control makes the nerve action normal. The pills, the sweat, the pepsin may merely touch the branches of the tree, but they do not get at the root. The stomach is the place where medicines are taken. The fact that the great majority of our physical ills are due to stomach impairment or inefficient work has caused the country to be flooded with stomach remedies which artificially stimulate or artificially aid digestion. The gullible public, impressed with the wonderful claims and testimonials, buy the nostrums in tremendous quantities. There should be a law to prevent this quackery, and some day there will be such a law. I am pleased and encouraged to see that people are commencing to think and will listen to rational methods, helpful suggestions, and common sense. They are learning to think, and when the ability to think and the power of mental suggestion becomes universal, there will be less dope, fewer doctors, and healthier people. Chapter 20 You are a human being, equipped and fortified to defend yourself against all odds. The moment you show failure that you are not afraid, just then failure becomes afraid of you, because he's a bully, a bluffer, and therefore a coward. If you have stumbled, if you have gone down in defeat time and time again, you are not broken, but will begin to gather your strength bit by bit with grit and wit, until you make a hit, and fool all who thought you had been broken. You can do it, I know. You will take your defeats and errors and mistakes and use them as valuable experience for the future. Your bones will knit if they have been broken, your bruises will heal, your cuts will grow together. Time will take care of them, and there will be only scars left. You may be scarred, but you will not be scared. You may have been battered, but you are certainly bettered, and you will no longer be fettered, for you are going to assert your God-given willpower and take the reins and do the driving instead of being led and pulled downhill. You may have lost your money, but that really means you have only lost time. You have gained experience, and your time will do double service for you in the future by virtue of that glorious experience. You have not lost your manhood or your life. Everything else can be replaced, and you know it. You are learning to think right, and when you think right, you can fight right. When you think wrong, you cannot be strong. While others moan and groan, you will jump and hump, and you will get there. Get your backbone right, and your jawbone too. Failure has tried to keep you down, it has pulled the strings to your bow, but you are going to snap back, for you have abundant resources, and there is no such word as fail to you, because you simply will not give in. You used to spend your time yearning for strength, but now you find strength only comes by earning it. Henceforth you are to be pointed out as the strong one, who was beaten and battered, but by scientific thinking and living have got back health and pep. You are to be an example to others to prove that they may come back as you have done. You will whisper courage to those in Shadowland and tell them to wake up and find their strength. You will be invincible the moment you make your willpower do its duty. Tackle the smaller things first for practice, overcome them one by one, and later on you will as easily overcome the bigger things which you think are standing in your way of progress. The world is a sieve that lets the little narrow worthless trash slip through and separates the really big worthwhile kind. That's the kind you are. The world needs strong, powerful sons and daughters, and it has a way of setting them up amongst other people and jostling them around, bumping them against one another until they are well polished. The world soon finds who is who, but it never would be able to differentiate unless the tests of endurance were made. Leaders are not discovered or picked off trees. Leaders are those who prove themselves, and the proving ground is right here amongst us. It is life, with all its stones and hits and bangs and bruises and jolts and jars. The world shakes us up to see who is who. The big ones, by shaking process, rise to the top, and the little ones disappear with the trash. If you are lacking in courage or grit, and have not the willpower and strength, if your views are twisted or warped, you cannot stand the test, and you will slip through with the trash. But you are not lacking. You have these strength qualities, and have perhaps not been awakened to them. Here, then, is the rousing or awakening time. 
success will not be handed to you in a pretty blue box tied with silk ribbons i can give you no panacea by which you can be worth while without effort on your part you must fight alone for your place and you must fight fairly and patiently forget your pedigree throw aside your family pride your aristocracy of birth your advantage of heredity these are all impedimentia strip clean and go to it you must fight alone i have shown you the weapons and given you the rules of strategy i have been training you to make you fit but you must make the fight and you will make that fight and you will win this i promise you and i know whereof i speak end of chapter 16 through 20 recording by j a carter www.pleonic.com Chapters 21 through 25 of Pep, Poise, Efficiency, Peace by Colonel William Crosby Hunter. Recording by J. A. Carter. Chapter 21 One of the greatest benefits you will receive from mind mastery will be shown in your relation to physical ailments. I do not go to the extreme of saying you can wish away the pain of an abscess in your tooth. But I do say, you can lessen that pain by rising mentally superior to it, and intoxicating yourself with the belief that you can stand the pain until nature breaks the abscess or the dentist relieves it. Pain and illness are merely nature's indicators that the normal conditions have been disturbed. It is a wise provision, to you who have reason and willpower, for you can set about to relieve the causes which produce the effect, and you can do it in a natural way. Fruit water and exercise will relieve the constipation a good sweat will cure the cold regulation of the stomach fresh air or resting the eyes will receive the headache and so on willpower diet air exercise baths sleep relaxation these are nature's medicines and the greatest of these is willpower don't grumble or whine over every little pain or distress the trouble will be gone in a short time if you exert your willpower and direct your mind away from your aches instead of upon them. It is because nature mends and cures that doctors thrive. It is not their medicines that cure, but your faith in the medicine and the doctor. You can just as well assert your faith without the doctor and without the medicine. There are ten million people in the United States who do not take medicine, and there is less mortality among these non-medicine takers than there is among those who call the doctor for every little pain they have. In cases of contagious disease, acute troubles, accidents, or wounds, call the doctor, of course. I am speaking of the aches, pains, and ailments of the everyday type, which are small and not serious in themselves, but seem big because they are aggravated by mental ferment rise superior to pain and it will pass away nature is a fine doctor and her fees are lowest chapter twenty two the benefits from right thinking are apparent on every hand common sense thinking is bringing about an evolution in religion that is gloriously hopeful back yonder and not so far back either persecution drowning burning of so-called witches imprisonment and wars were common under the flag of religion the hindu woman threw her babe to the crocodiles or threw it under the wheels of the juggernaut as a sacrifice to religion better thought has stopped these things a score of years ago the preacher was excommunicated who dared to say hell was not fire and brimstone today there is hardly a preacher who believes in literal hell fire we are far from perfection and have just commenced progress toward the universal religion of the god of love charity tolerance kindness good deeds the religion of smiles instead of tears sorrows and self-condemnation we shall have to tear down these lines of sects divisions and creeds we must stand together with a broad purpose and under the banners of liberal belief and brotherhood welfare the church has kept in too narrow confines too much habit too much precedent and too much dogma narrow minds have made narrow views prayer generally is selfish begging and not broad uplifting communion this narrowness of vision this selfishness rivalry between sects this dogma or rather bull dogma has been retarding the progress that should develop faster and will develop faster from now on the preacher of tomorrow will as some are doing today preach faith love joy peace instead of fear hate 
sadness, and suffering. The new joy notes of the church will be comfort instead of distress. The new thought and the new practical religion will be as much greater in the matter of development and scope as the lines of Omar Khayyam are greater than Mother Goose rhymes, or as the ninety-third psalm is greater than the lamentations of Job. God is all-powerful, all-present, all-seeing, and the purpose he has is love, not hate, joy, not sorrow, health, not illness, strength, not weakness, faith, not fear. His message on earth, taught by the Savior, was a simple message. It was a message of joy. It frowned on forms, sects, and creeds. It was, Come unto me, and whosoever believeth in me shall not perish. I have travelled much, I have met many ministers, I have listened to them talking to one another, and what did I hear? Our new building, raising a fund, paying off the mortgage, the splendid character and standing of our members, always dollars, buildings, business, social affairs. Again, I listen, and it is the call the minister receives to a larger field of usefulness, etc. The preacher and the pugilist usually go where they hang up the biggest purse, but times will change. There is to be a better condition, a broader religion, a happier religion of cheers, not tears, smiles, not frowns, faith, not fear. And the members will sing, we must know each other here instead of we shall know each other over there. And you know this is so. I may jar some of my friends in this chapter, and those who do not know me may think I am not a member of a church. I am a Presbyterian, and give all credit to my church, but I know the church will progress. It has progressed from the old days of heretics, hell-fire, and stern, sad faces. I was baptized in the church where there was no organ, and later when they put in an organ, the church divided. Religious thought has progressed, and it will not stop, that's what I mean. And I am looking ahead, and trying to be a seven-day Christian during the evolution, instead of a Sunday church attendant whose Christianity is witnessed only on Sundays. The progress toward the new universal creed of joy, love, hope, and charity is very rapid, and I am very certain my prophecy will come true. That prophecy is, creed must go, Christians must teach joy and love instead of sorrow and hate, and all sects must join the get-together plan. Chapter 23 There are countless sorrows and sufferings and tears in the world that you can never alleviate. The undertaking is too big for you or for me. The Supreme Being will look after all the big things, and will be responsible for the general operation of the larger and more important things, if you will just attend to the little things you can reach from where you are. Get yourself right. Do the best you can. That is your duty, and that is what is expected of you. If each unit in the general scheme is right, the grand result will be right. Don't you worry about the dying people in India, or fret yourself because people across the seas are warring with one another. Don't you bother about evils you cannot stop. Do the thing you can do. The world is getting better only as fast as each individual unit is better. Every optimist helps just so much. As a unit, your first responsibility is to do right and be right yourself in act and thought and deed. I'm going to tell this same thing to everyone who reads this book, and to ask each of you to tell the others, and perhaps the wave of good impulse will widen out far more than we hope for. Anyway, every unit who helps makes a general improvement. Get your own vision clear. Kill off your own fear thoughts. Establish and hold faith and uplifting thought, and you have wonderfully improved the unit. Be strong. Nothing can harm you. The things you think are worries now will be forgotten about day after tomorrow. You will pass through these little present troubles, or through the big ones, if you please, just as you have passed through scores of troubles yesterday and the day before, which you have forgotten. Tomorrow is unborn. Yesterday is dead. Today is yours. That's your cue. To-day. You cannot change yesterday, nor help the things that have gone into the past. You must look forward, not backward. Do not worry about tomorrow until tomorrow has changed into today. Today is your day, and you are going to start now, this minute, to make the best of today. Even if you didn't start the day right, you are going to finish it right. Hereafter, each day you are to smile, to speak kindly and cheerily to everyone you meet. You will not do a mean act nor speak a word that is not true about anyone, and if the truth would hurt a person, then you will not tell it, but remain quiet. 
You are going to say, I will, instead of, I can't. You are going to write your blessings with indelible ink and trace your misfortunes on the shifting sands at low tide. You are going to have faith, not fear. All these things you are going to do henceforth, and as a reward each night when your head touches the pillow, you will have a sweet happiness, and you will go into a sound, refreshing slumber. I am authorized by that truthful old preceptor of mine, experience, to promise you these blessings. If worry tries to whisper in your ear, laugh at him, for he cannot hurt you. Persistently direct your attention away from worry thought, and insistently keep your mind on good thought. Your own proposition is plenty big enough for you, so you must dismiss the responsibility about other people from your mind. Their troubles cannot be helped by your worrying about them. Help yourself first, and by your example and suggestion, show others the way to help themselves. Chapter 24 Centuries ago, a Chinese philosopher said, The legs of the stork are long, the legs of the duck are short. I cannot make the legs of the stork short, neither can I lengthen the legs of a duck. So why worry? The duck only brings misery to itself if it spends its time envying the long legs of the stork. The duck should be proud of its ability to swim. It can go out to the middle of the pond where the stork cannot wade. The duck that envies the stork his long legs is a pessimist. The duck that glories in its superior swimming powers is the optimist. Envy, born of pride and vanity, kills peace and contentment until you dismiss it from your life. Vanity and pride tells you you want fine clothes, a better house, or more money to spend, and you turn your eyes upon those objects as things necessary for your enjoyment. That longing is envy. Envy likely becomes the most important thought you have and stays with you while you sleep and when you wake. You compare your material things with the more expensive material things your neighbors have, and your envy causes you to worry. Stop this comparison. Quit belittling the things you have. Probably the very person you envy in the matter of material things is envying you your health or appetite or some of the other blessings you enjoy. Stop complaining about the weather or your health or your poverty. Count your blessings. Get busy with your hands and brains doing useful things. Occupation shuts the door to envy and worry. Come to think of it, what can you possibly gain by fretting over the weather? As long as you live, weather will be good and bad alternately. Accept the weather as it is. Be thankful you are alive, and remember that the rain you're complaining about is probably helping the crops. The most frequent envy and worry we come across is about money, and I wish I had the power, like the fairy godmother, to let you have all the money you want for a few weeks to show you how impossible it is for money to bring happiness. I recommend that you read The Magic Skin, that wonderful book by Balzac that deals with envy and wishes, and shows what a footless thing money is as a method of producing happiness. I should like you to notice the faces of the next few millionaires you meet. I will give you a reward of a hard-boiled egg for every smile you can detect on millionaires' faces. As material possessions increase, worries increase and smiles decrease. Money-making is a foolish ambition if you really want happiness. You can be rich by saving your pennies, turning them into dollars, and hoarding them away, and while you're doing this, your heirs are counting the days until you die, and leave your fortune to them to squander. Save up your pennies, and your dollars will be blown in by your heirs. Money will get many things for you. It is a present help in time of sickness, but money as a means to happiness is a forlorn hope. The rich man you envy is looking at you, envying your health and contentment, while you envy his gold and bonds and jewelry and automobiles, he is envying your energy and strength and courage and health. And these treasures are far beyond the ability of dollars to purchase. Chapter 25 It is a mistake to think that all men are born equal. Nothing in nature is equal. No two trees, no two blades of grass, no two of anything nature produces are just alike. The secret for you to solve is to get the best results from the equipment you have. I have seen a one-armed man row a boat and a one-legged man ride a bicycle, but neither of these men did a good job. The man fitted by nature to be a blacksmith is wasting his time taking lessons in millinery. You should not attempt any calling or ideal which accident or nature has unfitted you. You must find your gait, and the gait you can go best is the one for you to follow. Quote, Life is a play the world a stage, unquote, as Bill said. 
if you can't be the star you can be captain of the roman mob or one of the mob or even a scene shifter the point is you can enjoy the play as well as the star performer there are to be master workmen and hewers of stone and there are to be laborers those who are laborers today may be hewers of stone tomorrow and day after tomorrow they may be master workmen those who progress are the ones who have the capacity the strength the ability and the patience which entitles them to promotion the master workman did not growl or complain when he was a laborer he knew that his job as laborer was but a stepping stone to a larger future it is right to have ambition but you must not have ambition which is clearly beyond the capacity of your talents let your ambitions above all things be for peace of mind and happiness and for a sufficiency to provide the necessary things of life for the loved ones rather than an ambition for riches to provide the unnecessary things in life for your loved ones men are not equal in mental or physical powers they are equal only in possessing the same opportunity to get happiness and joy and health a few more years and we will all have vanished from this life we will be equal only in physical stature in the grave in the value of our souls we shall be unequal in our measure and gold will not be the rule used to differentiate it will be a question of good deeds and the measure of good deeds will be in proportion as you and i have had capacity and opportunity the widow's penny will outweigh the millionaire's silken purse of gold the lowliest born may have developed into the noblest of them all no matter how hard your life has been there is a joy for every tear you have shed only you did not know perhaps how to find the joy or how to dry the tears life is better when you wear a sweet face than when your face is sour sneer at nothing judge no one for you likely will be found short weight yourself in the scales of justice you are going to be charitable because in your dark hours was learned what a beautiful thing charity was you will be just and fair because you have been unjustly treated you have lost much but you learned a splendid lesson in your loss because you kept your self-respect and found out that the only real hard luck in the world is loss of life or loss of health no one is going to get the best of you because you have learned to keep the best for yourself you cannot be kept down because you will not be downhearted you have learned that you can endure more than you thought and you know the value of blessings like charity justice smiles and you have learned that you came through all your troubles all right from now on your vision will be broader fairer and more charitable you are going to hold on to faith and determination to be bigger and better while others scold on and worry and get smaller and smaller you are not going to be a fatalist in thinking that all men are born equal but you are going to thank your stars that you were born way above the average in mental capacity and ability End of chapters 21 through 25. Recording by J. A. Carter. www.pleonic.com. Chapters 26 through 30 of Pep Poise, Efficiency, Peace by Colonel William Crosby Hunter. Recording by J. A. Carter chapter 26 here is a universal prescription for happiness and an antidote for worry poison this prescription is for old and young rich and poor weak and strong in other words it is for all it is a precious prescription and one i want you to remember and keep ever near you it is one of the greatest helps in this whole study of ours the prescription i am going to give you will cure you or your friends of worry it is the boiled-down essence of this whole book even as the ten commandments are the essence of the laws of the bible i want you to write this prescription for your friends it is not necessary to diagnose the case as the prescription fits all cases and is a sure cure doctors have changed in their methods the original doctor had charms fetishes and bitter medicines later on the doctor cured the patient with vile smelling and bitter decoctions then came the time of bleeding the patient i mean literally some of them still bleed the patients in the matter of fees doctors know that drugs at best give only temporary relief some of them are big enough to admit that ninety per cent of the non-contagious diseases are diseases of imagination and can be cured through the mind 
The doctor of today plays up hygiene, diet, and exercise. He gives you a small package of drugs and a big package of advice about eating, sleeping, and exercising, and the advice he gives you, free, is worth more than the drugs he charges you for. In all sciences, time has brought many changes, but this prescription is one that has endured for ages, and is one that will endure until time shall be no more. I call this great thing the golden prescription. It is composed of just eight ingredients, as follows. Good air, good water, good sunshine, good food, good exercise, good cheer, good rest, good thought. It doesn't make much difference how the ingredients are used, just so you get all of them. Take up the list each night and see that every ingredient has been used, for the prescription is greatly weakened if any of the ingredients are left out. Every day you live, and you are going to have many days to live. Take these eight mind and body builders, and your life will be one of the great testimonials to the efficacy of the prescription. If you forget all else in this book, just remember this golden prescription, and tie it to the golden rule, and then you will have a good thing plus. Is it not a fact that the mere suggestion of this golden prescription and the anticipation of the benefits it is going to bring you have made you feel better already? Chapter 27 I am going to tell you about some of the ingredients in our golden prescription. One of them is sunshine. Not only sunshine of countenance and bearing, but the real, literal, natural, outdoor sunshine. Sunshine is a fine tonic for our physical bodies as well as for our mental selves. Nature intended our bodies should have sunshine. One of my good friends who believes in practical physical culture has worked wonders with her little girl by giving her sun baths. Every day she has the little one bask in the sunshine without a stitch of clothing. In the winter time, of course, the child is indoors getting the sunshine through the windows, but in the summer time the little one is out on the open porch. I wish you could see what a marvelous, smooth, healthy skin that child has. The mother has never had to call the doctor. The little girl never has a cold. She does not suffer from heat or cold or change in the weather. Years ago, everyone lived much of the time out of doors. Then, worry and despondency were things very rare. With our modern civilization keeping us indoors so much of the time, we have witnessed a great change. With our indoor life shut in from the sunshine, we have brought gloomy thoughts to our gloomy rooms. Get outdoor sunshine, and you will bring in mental sunshine to the home, and you will spread cheer, will give courage, and will lighten hearts. Sunny homes make sunny people. Nothing will burn gloomy clouds like sunbeams of cheer. Foggy days make foggy thoughts, and these are the days we should make sunshine in our hearts to dissipate the gloom. The next ingredient in our prescription is good air. Go into a stuffy room or a crowded street car and you will have a headache. Remain in an illy ventilated room all day and you will have pains over your eyes. This is the warning from your business office, the brain, that you should go out and breathe fresh air. Fresh air contains oxygen. Oxygen purifies the blood. Good blood makes good bodies. Every drop of blood in your system goes through the lungs. The lungs are porous, like a sponge. The lungs hold the blood so that the oxygen can quickly reach it. Every breath of air you take goes through the sponge and mixes with the blood. As you expel the air, it carries with it the poisonous gas eliminated from the system. Don't you see that if you send in bad air to feed the blood upon, you will have starved blood, and that is mighty poor material with which to build new bones, muscles, or nerves? Every day, especially in the morning and evening, go out of doors, breathe in great big lungs full of pure air. Do not strain yourself, but fill every part of your lungs. Soon you will feel your blood tingling and your head will clear. Good breathing prevents sluggish blood. Sluggish blood leads to congested veins, congested bowels, congested liver, and indigestion. And we have learned that indigestion is responsible for most physical ailments. Isn't it a fine thing to know that you can burn out the impurities of the blood with good, pure air and deep breathing? Good air is necessary to good health. Open your bedroom windows, no matter how cold the weather is outside. 
keep your body warm with covers but let in plenty of air and in the morning you will feel like a new person if you have been used to sleeping with the windows down do not imagine that it is necessary that the wind should blow through your room in great draughts in order to supply you with fresh air if there is but one window in the room then the door should be partially open to allow the fresh air to pass through this chapter has had to do with air and sunshine the two most valuable tonics in the prescription you cannot take an overdose of either of them chapter twenty eight natural exercise is best because it is a pleasure as well as a benefit exercise in a gymnasium or exercise with apparatus is solemn and it is exertion and the mental wear offsets physical gain you need no golf club gymnasium or apparatus to get natural exercise shanks mares are better than kentucky thoroughbreds it is not necessary to use vibrators dumbbells golf clubs or artificial apparatus you have within yourself two great things to exercise with the legs and the lungs the wild animal exercises in captivity he knows nothing about apparatus you have seen animals that have lived in cages for many years some of them perhaps born in captivity you have wondered how they have kept strong because their lives in captivity are so different from their natural existence in the open from the lion's health we draw a lesson the lion makes the best use of his present existence he cannot roam the hills jump the streams or have the natural exercise he is accustomed to but nature provides some exercise for him and all that is necessary to keep him in good shape is to stretch his muscles the cat at your hearth is formerly a wild animal and used to outdoor exercise but your cat and his ancestors have for many generations lived in the house the cat is today a domestic animal in his evolution from the wild beast to the present tame house cat he has never forgotten how to exercise observe him when he arises from a sleep the first thing he does is to stretch and flex the muscles the cat also teaches us the lesson of repairing the waist for after exercise he invariably lies down to sleep the farmer has his hay fields and his outdoor duties to keep him well exercised but you who live in the city do not have such advantages and you should follow the example of the cat who learned to exercise by stretching his muscles you can exercise while sitting in a chair or while lying in your bed or when standing up before a mirror stretch your muscles take deep breaths bend and twist your body this will do you more good than a gymnasium the trouble with the gymnasium is that it makes you exercise too strenuously you work hard with apparatus and get yourself into a sweat generally you feel too warm because the ventilation is poor and the atmosphere seems stuffy so you open the windows your skin being covered with perspiration makes a fine place for the draft to strike and cause cold or congestion the best exercises are walking breathing and stretching the muscles strenuous exercise is not good for you you know very well that the cup winners and pugilists and track men who are trained athletes are proverbially short-lived people strenuous exercise works the heart and lungs to double activity it builds up hard muscles it's true let me say if your work is strenuous then the exercise of your work will take care of the muscle building if you are not actively engaged with your muscles you do not need hard knots or double strength for the purposes of your occupation conservation of strength is better than waste of strength through exercise beyond your bodily need chapter twenty nine the first thing in the morning and the last thing at night and during the day when you have opportunity stand up and take in fifteen or twenty deep breaths do not stretch your lungs too much just good full breaths then stretch your arms legs and your body twist your neck from side to side try to bring every muscle of your body into play even at your desk you can exercise by sitting erect and taking in good breaths stand up and imagine you have a fifty pound weight in your right hand stretch your muscles and raise your arm as though you actually had fifty pounds in your hand you will be surprised to see the strength that you can put into that arm and how you can feel that the muscles have been well exercised if your exercise at night brings out the perspiration just before you go to bed rub your body dry with a rough towel it will be good to bathe with cool water first rub your body briskly until it brings a red healthy glow to the skin then go to sleep and you will have no trouble with insomnia 
Exercise is nature's greatest medicine, if taken in a common-sense way, and it is a dangerous one, if indulged into excess. Exercise is necessary to clean the muscles, repair the waste, but particularly for the purpose of adding new material. Physical exercise helps the circulation, digestion, and regulates the liver. A good brisk walk, good breathing as you walk, a good drink of water before you start, will break up constipation and bring about far better results than a dose of pills or drugs. The great cause of constipation is lack of exercise, and it is much better to prevent constipation by exercise than to attempt to cure it by putting poison into the system. One is the natural method, the other is the artificial. Natural methods are best. Drink plenty of water, never ice water. Everything you take into your system passes out after the life-giving, nourishing properties have been extracted. Solids pass through the bowels. Liquids, laden with salt and other chemicals, pass out through the kidneys and urinary ducts and through the pores of the skin. A man of ordinary weight and in good health should eliminate about two quarts of liquid a day, and over half of this goes out in the form of perspiration. After exercise, you should have rest, for this is the time nature repairs your body and your brain and stores up energy for the body like a battery. Your battery must be replenished in order to have it complete its function, so you see the necessity of proper rest. When you worry, you can't rest well, and lack of rest prevents storing up strength and energy in your battery. Nature demands that you take rest. You must have it. Exercise lets down the high pressure of nerve tension and rests the brain. Physical exercise not only brings about the desire for rest, but it produces a natural tiredness that makes rest so sweet and enjoyable. Rest is nature's restorer. It builds and strengthens. It cleans the mind and makes you think better. In the time of rest, you get the benefit of thoughts which came to you in your active moments. Many of the benefits you get from this book will be gained because you read the chapters and learn the truths just as you go to rest, and the impressions are permanent. You should learn to take a few minutes' rest at intervals during the day. Sit down in your chair, quietly relax, and endeavor to clean out the brain and relax the muscles. You must exercise the lungs and diaphragm. A good way to do this is to laugh. The vibrations caused by laughter put the liver, lungs, and diaphragm in a quick jelly-like vibration and give pleasant sensation and exercise like that of horseback riding. During digestion, the movements of the stomach are similar to churning. Every time you take a breath, the diaphragm descends and gives the stomach an extra squeeze and pinch. The trouble is that the man who sits at a desk uses only part of his lungs and does not distend the diaphragm as nature wishes. Frequent laughing will make up for this lack of natural exercise of the diaphragm. Laughing wakes up the digestive organs. The heart beats faster and sends the blood bounding through the body. There is not a remote corner or a little inlet of the tiniest blood vessel of the body that does not feel the waves of motion occasioned by a good hearty laugh. Laughter accelerates the respiration and gives a glow to the whole system. It brightens the eye, increases perspiration, expands the chest, forces the bad air from the lung cells, and tends to restore that exquisite balance which we call health. Health comes from the harmonious action of all the functions of the body, working in a normal way. This poise, which we destroy by sleeplessness, bad news, grief, fear, anxiety, or worry, is fully restored by a hearty laugh. Laughter is an aid to digestion. That is why public speakers tell funny stories at banquets. It not only supplies the brain with cheerful thoughts and banishes worry, but it actually aids digestion. For your exercise each day, you ought to stand up, take deep breaths, stretch the muscles, walk several miles, spend a few minutes in little mental recesses during the day, and laugh and cultivate cheerfulness. Say funny things whether they come from your heart or not. They'll provoke laughter in the other person, and the very activity of trying to make others laugh will cause you to catch the spirit of it and learn to laugh yourself. Chapter 30 can you control your thoughts and keep from worrying? You certainly can. Have a little patience and plenty of faith that your willpower is going to banish worry. 
If worry could be banished by saying, Be gone, in a few minutes there would be no worry in the world. Worry is the child of fear. You must defy your fear troubles. You dignify them with too much importance. You must learn to think of other things. You can control your thoughts and keep from worrying just as surely as you can control your actions in the presence of others. I will demonstrate this to you. You have known men who say they just cannot help swearing, and yet when they get in the presence of ladies they curb their language and they do not swear. Why is this? Simply because they use willpower to control their tongues. You have worried, you have cried, you have been just miserable with the blues because you just could not help it. A child is hurt or someone is in distress and you rush to the rescue. Then where is your worry? Where are your tears? What has become of your blues? Your very thoughts were taken away from you by outside circumstances, and new thoughts took the place of the worry thoughts, and your tears dried and your worries vanished. Worry is incessant thought about yourself, coupled with fear and dread. You get into the mire of worry, and your feet get so tangled that you can't get out. You flounder and get yourself into a terrible fix, just because you give up and say you can't help it. But you can help it. Brace up. Exert your willpower. You are going to climb up out of it. Notice the importance of the word up. You are going to higher altitudes where you can see over the hills and get a broader view. There will be nothing dark and cloudy in the future to interrupt you in your journey and study. You must not worry about the weather. You must not grunt or growl. You must exercise and rest. You must learn to rest and to eliminate. You must cast off thoughts and cares about things you cannot control. Cut out envy. Pocket your pride, for envy and pride are partners of worry, and they intoxicate you into a mental state where you do not see things clearly. Get the good thought in. Say to yourself that you are traveling on the right road. No matter how you feel, you know you are right, and that is more to you than anything else in the world. Do not bother about what others do or say or think about you. You will not be sensitive to criticism. You know that the greater you are and the stronger you grow, the less you will be disturbed by what the they-say mischief-maker says about you. You have common sense, reason, good suggestions. You have acquired benefits in proportion as you have read and practiced the helpful truths we have brought to you in these chapters. From now on your progress will be greater than ever, for you are getting proof of what the mind can do for you when you make it do your bidding. There is now one special thing I want you to do for at least ten days. Do not go to the table at noon. Let your midday meal consist of one or two apples, skins and all. Chew them thoroughly. No matter how hungry you get, skip the noonday meal entirely, and you will be surprised at the benefit coming from giving your stomach a rest and house cleaning with apples to help scour it out. Occasionally, in the future, try these ten-day periods of two meals a day, with apples only as a midday tonic. Use your allotted noon hour for quiet relaxation if your work calls for physical exertion, or use it for a walk if your occupation is of a sedentary nature. End of chapters 26 through 30. Recording by J. A. Carter. www.pleonic.com.